Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's good to see all of you here on our um, first night of our uh, revival seminar. And I want to uh, extend a warm welcome to uh, Lee and Margie Benden, who are here with us this evening. Thank you for coming. We're excited for the beginning of our campaign over here. And thank you all who came out this evening. And we look forward to seeing you guys here every night that we have it and in the mornings on Saturdays when we have our, our campaign here. Um, but before I pray, I would like us to actually turn to somebody nearby and just greet them, say, it's good to see you, happy Sabbath, or happy that you're here. You, you can stand up too and, and move, it. it's okay. All right. Well, let's all take our seats now. Once again, welcome everyone tonight. And I know there's some who are still on their way. We'll, we'll pray for those people as well. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and bow our heads and begin our, our um, All About Jesus seminar. Let's bow our head. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Sabbath now that we could be here together. We could be um, fellowshipping here with one another, sharing a meal together, and now to to hear the, the word tonight. Lord, bless our speaker, um, Lee, and his wife, Margie, as they share with us uh, who Jesus is, and that we may be able to see and understand and get to know him uh, just a little bit more. And Lord, we ask that you start a revival here in this church, and that the city of Tempe may be able to see that something is happening here. Thank you, Lord, for everyone who's here. Give traveling mercy to those who are still on their way. And for those who are in the Valley of Decision, Lord, help them decide to come over here for our campaign. We thank you, Lord. We ask all this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to go from down here. It just feels like I'm too far away when I'm up there, so I can get closer to you this way. Yeah, well, you're. This is good. You're at least you're not in the back rows. Yeah, some of the places people hurry to get the back seat, so that's good. Um, we're glad to be here. We just, you know, came back from Washington yesterday, and uh, it was colder there than it is here. But it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like Palm Springs here right now. So. <laughs> Do you know, um, about three years ago, uh, there's a uh, survey organization uh, that's headed by a guy named George Barna, and he surveys all over North America. Anyway, he did a survey, a North American survey, and he was looking, among, among, among other things, he asked a question having to do with what the, um, the number one emotion, if a person was to just say that the emotion that drives them most, that, that, they, that, that dwells with them most, that they carry with them most, what would it be? And the survey revealed that in, in North America, the number one emotion was fear. Fear. North Americans frightened. I don't think North Americans have a monopoly on that either because it seems to be uh, global uh, as people look at what's happening uh, around us. Uh, and I think <clears throat> that that's all the more reason for us to take a look at the book of Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is a book that was written with the end of time in mind before Jesus returns. And one of the beautiful things about the book of Revelation is that Jesus is all over it. It's his book. And of course, the Bible is his book too. But the book of Revelation, he particularly had uh, uh, dictated, almost, you could say. So... The, the the thing that I love about Jesus and Revelation is that, remember, <clears throat> he said perfect love, God is love, and perfect love casts out all what? Fear. So can you think of a better focus point for a time when fear seems to be driving populations than to focus on Jesus who wants to dispel all fear? And so that's very exciting for me to think about uh, as things continue to sort of um, unwind around us. It's, no, it's good to know that we have a solid Savior who says you don't need to be afraid. 
Um, I have a friend named Buddy Hotelling. He's a dentist and a musician. And he, he says, when I read the Bible through from cover to cover, there's two points that jump out at me more than any other two. They just keep coming back at me throughout the Bible. Um, the first one is God seems to be trying to make a point with, with us how much he loves us. It's like God saying, I love you very much. And he said the second point that seems to come out over and over in Scripture is God saying to us, and I've got this. I've got this. I love you very much, and I've got this. And if we kept those two things in our mind, well, whatever happens, we don't have to be fearful. Anyway, Marge, I'm glad to be here. Uh, someone, uh, where's, oh, Bruce. <laughs> He's behind the camera. <laughs> I was looking for him. Uh, he, he said he was. He came to the seminar here 13 years ago. Or, or no, what, what was it? How many years ago was it? Uh, yeah, I, I did too, because I don't think it was 13. It was probably more like uh, eight or nine. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, we, we were here eight or nine years ago, something like that. And um, it's good to be back. Yeah, and it's good to keep talking about Jesus. Um, we're going to have a little theme song. Before we get to the theme song, though, I'm going to put a slide on the screen that tells you that we have a web address where we have some resources. Uh, the seminar, the, the, the resources are, are at this website, allaboutjesusseminars.org. And... Uh, Everything that we're presenting is also available to view online. It's also available to, there's downloadable resources that you can uh, print or, or track with. Um, I just tell you that because if, if for some reason, uh, you, we'd like to have you here for all of them, but if you're unable to make every meeting, you can catch up with the ones you might have missed by going to the website and catching them there. Pardon me? Yeah, it's, all, it's on YouTube as well, but... Um, the links are right there through our website. Now, I think the next slide is a blank slide, and then after that, we're going to have our theme song. This is a song that I mentioned that our, our friend, uh, Buddy Hotelling, uh, he's, actually, he's actually a musician disguised as a dentist. And he writes lots of songs, and we have a bunch of his albums, and he's helped us at several of the presentations we've made here and there across the country. But he wrote a little song for us to do for the theme song, and it's for this particular one. And it's a prayer for, for revelation. And so um, we're going to play it through. We're going to sing along with him. But you can kind of listen and, and sort of half sing if you want the first time through. But after the first time through, you've heard it. So you should be able to do it the second time with no problem. So he plays it through twice. All right, let's see how it will go, Margie. Let's click it on. Okay, the words are going to be on the screen. And we'll be singing along with Buddy. <laughs> like I said, you can just sort of... Come through it the first time around. Here we go. Lord, we enter your presence, seeking your face, needing your grace and your wisdom. Please come. And Lord, we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true at our eyes. See. And may this be a sweet celebration, love's revelation. You are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages in these final pages. Teach us the melody sung by a child redeemed. And we will be healed when you are revealed. And we will be healed when you are revealed. So that's it. Now we're going to go one more time. Lord, we enter your presence, seeking your face, needing your grace and your wisdom. Please come, and Lord, we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true in our eyes. I see, and may this be a sweet celebration, love's revelation. You 
are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages in these final pages, teach us the melody sung by a child redeemed, and we will be healed when you are revealed, and we will be healed when you are revealed. There. You did pretty good for a first time at it. We'll be doing this song quite regularly throughout the series. So halfway through, you'll be waking up in the night singing the song. It'll go through your head that way. Just saw some cute kids just coming in the door with their parents, I'm guessing, huh? All right. Glad that you're here. Yeah. Um, Margie is a school teacher. And she left the classroom to join me doing this revival ministry many years back now, but she didn't lose her love for children just because she left the classroom. So she does a feature. We call it For the Young or Young at Heart. And the reason that we call it For the Young or Young at Heart is when I pastored a local congregation years ago now, um, and if I was up on the platform waiting for the time where I was going to give the sermon or whatever, from the platform I had kind of a bird's eye view of the congregation and you could see who was asleep and who wasn't and who was on their phone and who wasn't and you know who was texting and so on. But you also notice something else. When it was time for the kids' feature, the adults would lean forward and they'd put their phone aside and they'd be paying attention, sometimes even their knees on their elbows on their knees, you know, kind of leaning forward. And then when the kids' feature was over and it was time for the sermon, then they sat back and they yawned. And they kind of cross their arms, and and I thought, you know, they seem to be more dialed into the kids' feature. The grown-ups seem to be dialed, more dialed into the kids' feature than than anything else. So so we decided a long time ago, we're doing this feature that she does. It sort of sets the tone for what I'm going to be doing next. It kind of ties in, and we call it for the young or young at heart, which means that even if there were no kids, we'd still do the feature because we're all young at heart. And if you don't think you're young at heart, then you have forgotten that you're going to live forever. And if you're going to live forever, I don't care if you're 90 right now. If you're going to live forever, you're just barely started. Just barely out of the starting gate. In fact, we could say you're still wet behind the ears, to use an old expression. So we're going to have Margie come up now and share this little feature with us. And she'll do that at the beginning of every one of the presentations. And then I'll do a presentation following that. So um, I don't know if these two kids would want to come forward. Do you want to come up for this? Come on down. Uh, you'd be happy. We'd love to have you come down. Okay. Margie has something she'd even like to have you maybe hold or look at. Come on. No, yes, yes. Come on. Such good-looking children, and that's good to see them. All right. Good, good, good. How old are you? Five. Wow. And this your sister? How old are you? How old is she? She's You're three. She's three. Oh, are you okay? Okay. So here's, here's what I need you to do. You sit right beside that dog right there, right there. In the, can, the can, can, the can you blanket? sit right over here okay. by the doggy and the blankie? Yeah. And then Margie will have you help her turn that thing on and some other things, all right? Yeah. All right. What's your name? David. We're going to shake my hand. All right, David. And hello, can I shake yours too? Okay. Adasa. Ooh, good, good. I think there I go. I got, got a little more volume now. Okay. Do you ever get scared at night? A little, I used to. And guess what? If I'm all by myself, I still do. But I'm telling you this story about somebody that gets scared at night. So sometimes if your mommy and daddy put you to sleep in the bedroom and you're all by yourself, I don't know if you share bedrooms or if you're in the same bedroom, I mean, or if you're in different bedrooms. But if I had to go into a bedroom where I was all by myself, and they told me good night, and they turned off the light, and it was dark. Oh, that was scary to me. Is that ever scary to you? It still is to me if I'm all by myself. But we have to remember who's there with us. Jesus is, right? But it 
always helped me because sometimes after mom and dad had said good night, sometimes they would come in afterwards. And if I was scared, I hadn't been able to go to sleep yet. And so maybe, just maybe, they would bring me in one of my favorite blankets that I could cuddle up to. Or maybe they brought me a favorite stuffed animal. You can press the button there. And this stuffed animal turns on little stars that go up on the roof. And they change color, too. Isn't that cool? Do you want to press the button there, too? Oh, look it. That's my favorite color, purple. Isn't that pretty? It doesn't show it in here because we have lights on, but it's really cool to see these stars and stuff up on the roof. Do you think that would help you if you were scared at night? A little bit, yeah, maybe. You want to hold that one? Okay, so, and then if mom and dad were to either cuddle with me or rock me or maybe even lay down beside me, would that be even better? Okay, and then I'll tell you what's the best is sometimes they would sit down or lay down beside me and tell, tell me a story. Would that be even better? Yeah. Does that happen for you sometimes? Yeah. Stories are the best, aren't they? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a story, all right? So I want you to pretend, and you're young at heart too, so you pretend you've got your blanket there with you. And you're going to listen to me tell you a story, okay? So this is a story of a guy in the Bible that was good friends with Jesus. He was one of the 12 disciples, and his name was John. Well, John loved Jesus with all of his heart. Do you love Jesus with all your heart? Do you? Yes, good. I hope so. Anyway, so John wanted to tell everybody about his best friend, John. Jesus. John wanted to tell about Jesus. Sorry. Anyway, so he did. That's what he would do. He would go here, and he would go there, and he'd go over here and over there, telling everybody about how he loved Jesus with all of his heart. And a lot of people started loving Jesus too. So much, excuse me, so much so that when uh, some people that didn't love Jesus and had put him to death heard that he was doing that, they got mad. And they sent soldiers to get him and take him away from his home. And do you know what they did with him? What'd they do? They what? Hey, what? Well, they took him out to an island. Do you know what an island is? Land that is surrounded by water. And it was a lonely island. And he was so alone out there. And he thought, I can't even share about my best friend Jesus. I can't talk to anybody hardly. And I miss Jesus. Jesus said he'd come back, but he doesn't seem to be coming back. And I'm out here all alone. And it was Sabbath, and he was feeling especially lonely and sad because Sabbaths were a day that he used to share more about Jesus even then. You think you could give her a turn too? Thank you. Anyway, uh, oh, okay, that seems like a fair trade. There you go. Okay, anyway, so here he is on that Sabbath, and he's lonely and sad, and do you know what? All of a sudden, it gets bright. It gets bright, and there's somebody that appears to him. Somebody bright and beautiful. Do you know who it was? Jesus, yeah which he is God, you're right. So there is Jesus, and he's bright and shiny and wonderful. And he tells John, John, I don't want you to be discouraged. I told you I'd come back to get you, and I will. And I want to tell you some special things. And so he told him 
several things and he told him to write it down and then he gave us him a vision do you know what a vision is kind of like a dream and he showed him lots of things that would happen later on in our world on our earth and he said john don't be afraid because i am going to come back and get you i love you so much and i love all the believers that love me and follow me I'm coming back for all of you. You think that made John feel lots better? Yes, it sure did. And so that comforted John and brought him a lot of courage and hope when he was getting older and then he fell asleep in what we call death. But he did not die sad and lonely because he knew Jesus was going to come back for him. Do we know that? Do we know Jesus is coming back for us? How about you? Do you think he is going to come back for you? Do you think he's coming back for you? Yeah, he sure is. Anyway, that was a story in Bible days, but I'm going to tell you one more quick story, and it's about somebody that was on in more close to, lived more close in our times, our days and age, okay? And he was, you said you're five, David, well, this boy was a, a little bit older than you, and he loved his grandfather. You love your grandfather? Yeah. Anyway, he loved to be together with him, and one Sunday, his grandpa said, Harold, that's what his name was, but some of you may recognize his name a little more by HMS Richards. That's who young Harold was. And he loved being around his grandpa, and I loved being around my grandpa, too. A loving grandpa is such a special thing. But Harold's grandpa came up to him, and he said, Harold, do you want to go out with me? I'm going to go out and check my animal traps. Did you ever hear about people that would set traps to catch animals? And then they would get the fur off of them and they would sell it to people that wanted furs. And that's how they bought a lot of their foods or their things they needed for their house. It was a little different from our day and age. But anyway, that's what he did. So he was going to go out and check his traps for the animals. And he said, Harold, would you like to go out with me today? And oh, Harold was so excited. He said, yes, yes, I want to do that, Grandpa. Because it was a special thing to get to do that with his grandpa. So they went out, and they're walking and walking all day long, checking this trap and checking that one, and fixing anything, if anything need to be fixed with it. And then do you know what happened? The sun started going down. And though it was pretty outside, it was starting to get a little cold. And it was poor Harold. He was tired. It had been a long day. And he was walking a little slower. And his grandpa said, oh, dear, i got to do something because I'm not done yet. But Harold can't keep on going with me. So do you know what he did? He came... Uh, he told Harold, he said, there is something up ahead. There's some rocks. And we're going to put a picture on the screen to show you. There's some rocks and a rock up ahead that has like a little hole in it. And you can climb up there. I'll help you get up there. And you'll be up on the ledge and you'll be warm and you'll be cozy and you'll be safe there. And you can rest there until I come back and I'll get you and take you home. And you'll be safe and warm. Don't worry. I'll come back for you. Would you believe your grandpa if he told you that? Yeah, because grandpas that you love, they tell you the truth, right? You, you hope and pray they do. Most of the time they do. Anyway, so that's what grandpa did. He put Harold up on that little ledge in the rock. And Harold at first, was a little bit scared. He'd hear some bird noises that sounded creepy, and he heard another noise that sounded like this. Ow, ow, ow! Ow, ow, ow! And he thought, 
oh dear, that's a little scary. But my grandfather told me I'm safe here. He said I'm protected here and he'll come back for me. So I shouldn't be afraid because I could trust my grandpa. And then he remembered something else. Who else was with him too? Jesus or God? Yeah. And so then he thought, well, I'm going to pray to him. So he did. And then wonderful Jesus helped him to fall asleep there until all of a sudden grandpa was going, Harold, it's time to go home. And he scooped him up and carried him back to where their car was and where they could go home. Well, do you think there's anybody that we can love and trust even more than a loving grandpa and parents? How about this guy? Can we love and trust him? When he says, I'm going to come back for you, do you think he's going to keep his promise? He we sure will. And he's going to come back for you. And he's going to come back for you and me and all of you. And I want all of us to be there, don't you? Oh, can't wait. And I do you think he's going to keep his promise? He's never broken one yet, so we can trust him just like we trust a loving grandpa or parents, right? Oh, I'm so glad. Let's talk to him in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, that you told us you're coming back for us. It gave John peace to hear you tell him that. And it gave Harold peace as he was up there waiting for his grandpa. And it gives me peace. And my friends here tonight, I'm sure too, to know that you're, you haven't broken your promises and you're not about to. You're going to come back for us. Tomorrow, maybe? Wouldn't that be great? But no, you know the best time. And when it is, I can't wait. It's going to be wonderful. I want to go home with you. I pray you'll prepare us to live forever with you each and every day as we're your friend right now. As we read about you in the Bible and talk to you in prayer, oh, and share your love with others, it will get us closer to you now so we can live forever with you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen. All right. Thank you for coming up. And I'll take these back. And I am so glad you came. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I'd like to have one more prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, when Jesus was here among us, and his disciples asked him if he would teach them to pray. He did that. And as he was teaching them, he also told them that if they prayed and asked where two or three are gathered together, that his spirit would come and be with them as well. And I'm praying for your spirit, Lord Jesus, to be with us just now. As we look into your word and we look at your direction, we want our hearts to be stirred. You told Nicodemus heavenly things were heaven it required spiritual insight from above, and I'm asking for that for us. We want to see you in the book of Revelation, and so please make that make that happen in Jesus' name. Amen. I, was there a Something started talking. Yeah. Do you remember the road to Emmaus? The story after the resurrection on Sunday morning, Jesus has uh, risen. His body's gone, not the tomb. And there's two disciples. They're not part of the 12, but they're followers of Jesus. And they're very disappointed and they're leaving. They've been in Jerusalem and they're heading back to Emmaus, which is about seven miles away. They're walking back and they're very discouraged, very depressed. They're probably weeping as they talk to each other about what's just happened to Jesus. Uh, their hearts had been wrapped up with his and their hopes had been shattered when he died. And now as they're walking along, you know the story. Suddenly, the Bible says they are joined by Jesus himself, but they don't recognize him because the Holy Spirit has sort of made it so that they don't 
catch on that it's Jesus. I don't know what that means. It says their eyes were veiled that they might not see him for who he really was. Anyway, as he pulls up alongside, he says to them, why are you guys so depressed? And they looked at him like, are you kidding? Are you a stranger around these, these parts? Depressed? I'll tell you why we're depressed. They just killed Jesus. They tell that to Jesus. They just killed Jesus. And Jesus says, no. What happened? So they tell Jesus what happened to Jesus. And as they finish telling him, they say, now do you understand why we're so depressed? We actually thought he was the Messiah. And now he's gone. And then Jesus says to them, you idiots. Well, you might not say he didn't say idiots. But what he said to them, and the Bible says he said to them fools. You fools, and I think fools are first cousins to idiots. So anyway, I just is sort of a loose paraphrase. Anyway, he says, you fools. And they said, why are you calling us fools? And they say, he says to them, because everything that you just got done telling me that happened to Jesus, it was prophesied in the Bible. The prophets in the scriptures, everything. They go, no way. He says, yeah, everything you just said happened to Jesus was prophesied in Scripture. So then he says, let me show you. And the Bible says, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he showed them in Scripture all of the things concerning himself. And as he showed them how the prophecies were about the very things and events and circumstances that happened to Jesus, it says that they were just dumbfounded. They were amazed. They now, this is interesting because the Jews of Christ's day were really big into prophecy. And the reason they were so into prophecy was because they believed the prophets were telling, uh, telling them that, that the Jewish nation was going to become the world power. And everything was going to be, you know, Jerusalem was going to be the center of the world. And they were going to be on top of the dog pile, so to speak. And they were really looking forward to that. Um, but they'd never seen Jesus in prophecy. Wouldn't it be horrible to be specialists in prophecy without seeing Jesus. That would be tragic, to be specialists in prophecy seminars, for example, and miss Jesus in them. That's what had happened for them. But as he showed them all the things concerning himself, and could you imagine being given a Bible study by Jesus? Wouldn't that be something, have Jesus give you a Bible study? And then show you as he's giving you the Bible study that this is all about me? Oh, this is about me right here? And over here, did you know this was about me? And did you know this is a symbol that represented me? And did you know that when they did this, that was all about something that I was going to be doing? And, you know, anyway, well, they lost track of time as they're traveling with him. They get to their home and they say, hey, why do you spend the night with us? And he said, sure. So they come on in. Uh, they throw some food on the table. They sit down to have supper. And they ask Jesus if he'd have the prayer for the meal, give thanks for the meal. He said, yes, he would. And then he raises his hands to bless the food. And as he does so, the Bible says that their eyes were suddenly opened, that they might recognize who it really was. And as soon as they recognized it was Jesus, he disappeared, just vanished right before them, gone. And they slapped their foreheads. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us? as he showed us himself along the way. And then they took off running back to Jerusalem to tell everybody he's not dead, he's alive. And we just walked with him and we just ate with him or we were going to eat with him before he left. But the point that I'm drawing from that story is that he showed them from prophecy all about himself. And we're going to do something with the book of Revelation. If you notice, when you first open the book of Revelation, the very first page, it does not say the revelation of Antichrist. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say the revelation of false churches. It doesn't say that either. What it says is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look for Jesus Christ in the book entitled Revelation. Look for him. And we're going to look for how a relationship with him rises to the surface in this last book of the Bible. Um, so <clears throat> let's, and that was the little picture there of uh, those guys on the road to Emmaus. So let's go ahead and turn to Revelation chapter 1. I have it on the screen for you. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, also it says next, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy 
and blessed are those who hear it. So there's a special blessing in this book for those who read it and those who hear it being read and take to heart what is written in it because the time is near. So this is Jesus' own book. I said earlier that the Bible is, of course, inspired by God, but the book of Revelation is almost as though Jesus said to John, I want you to take a letter. Please get out a pen and paper and, and write down what I tell you. So this is like direct from Jesus. And there's a promised blessing to those who listen and to read. So that means that includes us right here tonight because we're listening to it being read. We are looking at the words on the screen and there's a blessing in it for us. That's what the Bible says. There's a blessing in it for us. Now there are some people, many people in fact, who think that the book of Revelation is difficult to understand and it's encrypted, and it's like in code, and it requires deep uh, theological training and the understanding of biblical languages and all kinds of other things in order to decipher it. It requires experts to help us navigate our way through. But you know what? If that was true, they should have changed the name of the book. Because if you think about it, the name of the book is what? Revelation? So does Revelation sound like something that's obscure and hard to understand and, you know, difficult? No, Revelation. It's not called the book of encryption. It's called the book of Revelation. <clears throat> in fact, it reminds me. Uh, when we're not traveling, we live in a little town called Walla Walla, Washington. And there is a college, or now they call it a university, there. And um, they have dormitories, just like across the way here. Uh, you've got a university. Uh, they have dormitories there. And I, this is an interesting story. Uh, in, in one of the women's dormitories, girls' dorms, women's dorms, whatever you want to call it, they had uh, a, in, in a given particular hall, there was a central kind of a shower and, and restroom, bathroom kind of facility in the hall. And there, there were four what we would call, I suppose, stalls or little cubicles in that restroom where there were toilets. Anyway, one of the doors that gave privacy to the cubicle had fallen off its hinges. And so the girl's dean had requested the uh, maintenance personnel to come and re put, repair the door, put the door back on. And, um, but, the, but the maintenance team was uh, overburdened with a lot of things that were uh, needing attention. And so time went by before they got to fix that door. Um, so much time went by that when they finally came to fix the door, the students had done something humorous. Uh, they had put signs. They had written, they'd made signs using computers and they had these pretty little signs, and they'd put a sign over each one of the four little stalls or cubicles. Um, the first sign said, John 1. The next one said, John 2. The next one said, John 3. And the one without the door said, Revelation. <laughs> Revelation. The idea was, oh, it's exposed. It's not hard to see what's in that one. And the concept here is the book of Revelation is not intended to be encrypted. It's not intended to be hard to understand or hard to see. And so we're going to take a look at it with that in mind. We're told that um, God gave this message to Jesus. So God the Father is involved. Then we're told that Jesus appeared on Patmos, the island, and gave it to John himself. Jesus also mentions in this uh, first chapter that, and we just read it on the screen, that his angel is involved in the delivering of the message. So that would be Gabriel, the highest angel in heaven. And then uh, John says he was in the Spirit on the Sabbath day when he was given. So now the Holy Spirit's involved as well. So the point here is that all three of the Trinity... God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as well as Gabriel, the number one angel in heaven, are all involved in the delivering of this book to John. Which makes me think that they must think it's pretty important. Because the whole team shows up for this, right? Whole team. Well, the background. Margie made a little bit of a sort of a lead in for that as we think about the background uh, out on uh, the island of Patmos. I think I have a slide here of John sitting there on the rock looking out into the 
He's old. He's gone on in years now. And he's on this island of Patmos. And he's looking out across the Aegean Sea. And he's meditating on a particular Sabbath. He's once been referred to as the son of thunder. Um, you remember that he had quite a temper like his father. And there was even a time when he wanted to nuke an entire village just because they weren't wanting to be hospitable to Jesus. And he came back and said to Jesus, shall we nuke him? You know, shall we just go ahead and destroy the whole village, call fire down and destroy him? And Jesus said, oh, John, you don't know what spirit you're of when you talk like that. But now this guy who was once known as the son of thunder. Oh, man, did you know what? Over 42 times in the first, second and third John, he says, let's love one another. Let's love one another. God is love, and if we are of God, we're going to love one another. Uh, he's been transformed over time as he spent time with Jesus. And there he is looking across the Aegean Sea, and he's by himself because he's been banished. And he longs and yearns to be reunited with congregations who love Jesus that he had fellowshiped with prior to being banished. It's been 65 years since he's seen Jesus. 65 years since he's walked and talked with Jesus. He watched Jesus leave for a better place, telling them as he was leaving that he was going to return and he was going to take them with him. Angels had told the disciples, he's coming back for you. Jesus himself had said he would return. Um, but now 65 years has gone by and, he, and there's been no sign of Jesus coming back. He actually thought it would have already happened. You know, um, <clears throat> my grandfather, my dad's father, didn't think he would live long enough to go to college because he thought Jesus was going to come before he could go to college. My father... So obviously my grandfather made it to college, ended up getting married, had children of his own, and my father thought he would never live long enough to have a family, get married or have a family, because Jesus would come before he could do that. And I came along, and I didn't think I would make it to college, nor did I want to go to college. So that was a good thing to have Jesus come so I wouldn't have to go to college. But obviously now I have gray hair. I've been to college, been there, done that. Have a family as well. The reason I didn't think I would live to go to college was because I thought Jesus was going to come before that. And as we look around at world events, it's easy to consider and to maybe even conclude, boy, his coming is just right around the corner. But they've been thinking that. For 2,000 years. And John had been thinking it for 65. And he hadn't come yet. One by one, John's friends have all fallen in death. Some by disease. Living on planet Earth isn't user friendly. Some just flat out by getting older. Again, because living on planet Earth is not user friendly. Age. Uh, some, by persecution of his friends, have been killed by persecution. Uh, his own parents, Zebedee and Salome, they've died, so he's outlived his parents. His brother James had been the first martyr for Jesus, beheaded. Um, remember on the cross, Jesus said to John, take care of my mother. Well, now Mary, the mother of Jesus, is gone. She's passed. Um, Peter was crucified. Uh, Paul was beheaded. In fact, other than Judas and John, every other disciple, other than Judas and John, every other disciple has died a martyr's death. Uh, and John would have died a martyr's death several times by now, except that he, he, kept, he keeps getting predict, protected. And it's kind of like the cat with nine lives they talk about. John just keeps making it. They try to kill him and they can't kill him. And Finally, they say, well, we can't get rid of him. We can at least put him somewhere where he can't influence anybody and then put him on this island. So that's where he is. Um, he's in his mid-80s, more likely than not. He's already surpassed that three score and 10 that the Bible says is what we're given on planet Earth. 
And he's very sad as he sits there looking out across the water that Jesus hasn't come back yet. He's sad. And he's wondering because the devil would love for us to think that Jesus isn't coming back. And so the devil is interjecting into his head thoughts. He's not coming back. Would you come back to this dark planet after what they did to you if you'd been him? They didn't treat him very well. Don't be thinking he's coming back. If he was going to come back, he would have come back a long time ago. No, he's not coming. He's not coming. And so John's struggling with discouragement. I was just talking to somebody the other day uh, in our little town of Walla Walla where we have Home Depot. We have a Home Depot. And do you know what they've had to do in our little town of Walla Walla, which is just a little small kind of almost a farm community? Most of the shelves in our little Home Depot are now behind lock and key, behind cages. And the reason, you know why that is? Shoplifting. Because the world we live in today is so morally declined that shoplifting... There's a town, uh, Everett, Washington, which our son lives in. Walmart in Everett, Washington, went out of business. They shut it completely down. There is no more Walmart in Everett, Washington. And you know why? And Everett, Washington is a pretty good-sized city. The reason there's no Walmart in Everett, Washington, is because they couldn't make business work because of all of the shoplifting. They went out of business because of stealing and theft. And it's easy to look around at a world like this and say, where are we headed and what's gone wrong? It's just getting worse and worse and worse. Jesus has to come. He's got to come. But John's thinking, Jesus has to come. He's got to come. He hasn't come yet. We're not the first to think this way. Will there really ever be a resurrection? Will Jesus really return? Will I ever see my friends or family again? These are thoughts that the devil is trying to interject into John's mind. Oh, he thinks to himself, how I'd love to have another visit with Jesus. If I could just have a talk with Jesus, I'm sure. You know that? There's a song that says, a little talk with Jesus makes it right, all right. And John's thinking, if I could just have one more talk with Jesus before I die, I'm sure I could rest in peace. R-I-P, I I could rest in peace. And as he's thinking thoughts of this sort, suddenly his reverie is shattered, blasted by what he describes as a trumpet-like voice. Trumpet-like. What does that mean? Well, a trumpet is a very piercing sound. In fact, that's why often in times past, the armies would be marshaled and led by trumpeteers who would trumpet out certain notes and things as prearranged with the general and so on, the commanders, that would indicate what they were supposed to do. Why? Because everybody could hear the tone and the note of the trumpet. Above the noise of all of the battle and confusion, they hear the trumpet. And and John says, a trumpet-like voice. So it's very piercing hard to miss, shatters his reverie. And and in Revelation 1, verses 10 to 11, he says, it was the Lord's day. I was worshiping in the spirit and suddenly I hear a loud voice behind me, a voice that sounded like a trumpet blast. It said, write down what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Write it down. His heart is pounding. He hasn't dared turn around yet, but something big is happening. The island is ablaze in light. And it's not coming from the direction of the sun. It's coming from the opposite side. So he's thinking, I don't know what's going on, but it's supernatural. Do I dare turn? He turns to see who's talking. And to his amazement, the island really does appear to be on fire. Radiation, it just seems to be glowing. He says, I saw seven golden lampstands. And there in the middle of all those lampstands, there was somebody walking and moving among them. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were bright like flames. His feet were as bright as bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. Well, you don't hear a lot of ocean waves here in Phoenix, but if you've ever been by a shore on the coast, 
especially in the wintertime when the winter storms are raging. You can feel in your gut, you can feel the waves crashing, the, the vibration and actually penetrates the ground and, and the, the sound and the roar. I've been beside the ocean in deep, deep uh, winter storms. They're, they're amazing to behold the power and so on. Anyway, he says that voice that was speaking had that kind of power, that kind of punch. Spoke like thunder. And it makes me think about Jesus and his voice. You remember when he was on the cross? And he shouted, what were his final words? It is finished. And you know what I think? I think when Jesus shouted, it is finished, I think his voice echoed all the way across the cosmos. I think his voice was heard throughout the entire universe. And the sound uh, uh, just washed up against the walls of the New Jerusalem, the heavenly city, and they heard it there the voice of Jesus sweeping across the ages and across the universe. That's the one who's talking right now. Uh, verses 16 and 17 say that he held seven stars in his right hand and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. His face was as bright as the sun in all its brilliance. Well, when's the last time you looked straight at the sun? No, you don't do that very often, no. But his face is as bright as the sun in all of its brilliance. And when I saw him, John says, I fell at his feet as what? Dead. I guess so. He just, whomp, he fainted. He was overpowered by the majesty, the brilliance, the sound, the voice, the, 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 the moment, the whole thing. It was just overpowering. And he falls to the ground. Do you know, I wonder if as he hit the ground, if he had any kind of, you know that expression, deja vu, you ever heard that one? Means I've been here, done this, this seems something familiar about this. You know, I wonder if that went through his head. Because once before, if you recall, John saw Jesus blazing. The mount was called the Mount of Transfiguration, remember that? And he's there with Peter and his brother James. And they see Jesus, and if you read the story there, as Jesus appears before them there in the middle of the night on fire, ablaze, and it says his clothing was as white as, as, uh, as the sun and bright as the sun. Do you remember what it says they did? They hit the ground then too. They fell to the ground as dead. Peter, James, and John fell to the ground as dead men. And when that happened at the transfiguration, do you know what the next thing happened? Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. That's what he said to them as they lay there cowering on the ground as though they had been struck by lightning. Do not be afraid. Fear not is the words in the King James. Fear not is another way of saying don't be afraid. Um, I did something kind of fun. I have a computer that has the Bible on it and you can do some amazing searches and you can link up different phrases and try to find things in Scripture using the computer that make it much easier than you could do if you just used a, a, a paper, uh, you know, concordance or chain reference sort of a thing. And so what I did is I thought, I wonder if you were to search through the Bible, how many times you would find the phrase, fear not or don't be afraid, in conjunction with, connected to, God. So I put the two phrases, I put, I put the phrase fear not, and then I asked the computer to search for deity uh, and that phrase simultaneously. And do you know what? I found something very amazing. I didn't realize until I did the search, but uh, Jesus appears in numerous places in Scripture, in the Old Testament as well as in the New and and he he almost always says fear not when he when he shows up. Um, so he, the first place I found was he said fear not Abraham. Jesus appears to Abraham. Abraham's first reaction is fear, and Jesus says to him fear not. Um, Hagar, remember Hagar, the servant of Abraham. He says fear not to her. Fear not Hagar. Fear not Jacob. Fear not Moses. Fear not Israel. Fear not Gideon. Fear not Joshua. These are all people who have encounters with Jesus, and he says, fear not, when he shows up. Jehoshaphat, a king, tells him not to fear. 
Isaiah, he shows up, asks him to become a prophet for him. The first thing he says is not to fear, fear not. Daniel, same thing, fear not. Daniel, Mary, when she's being told she's going to have the baby of Jesus, you know, the angel representing the heaven says, the first thing it says to her is fear not. Emissary straight from heaven, fear not. Uh, Joseph, her husband, the guy who married her, Joseph the carpenter from Nazareth, uh, angel, same angel appears to him. Angel says to him, fear not, Joseph. You keep seeing this thing in Scripture. Um, Zacharias, fear not, Zacharias, fear not. The shepherds, remember the shepherds in the fields taking, keeping watch by night? What did the angel say to them? Emissaries from heaven, good news from heaven. What is the first thing they say? The first thing they say to the as they appear is, fear not, don't be afraid. Oh, but no, 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 it's, it's going to be okay. So it's okay. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. Um, Simon Peter, Jesus appears to him. Fear not, Simon Peter. Uh, Jair Jairus, remember the, remember the guy who had a girl who was dying or had died? Um, Jesus is with him. And he uses the same words. The people from, 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 from Jairus' home come, and they say, don't trouble the master any longer. Your little girl's already dead. It's too late. And one of the first things that Jesus said, he says, fear not, Jairus. Fear not. Says their name. Says, don't be afraid. Uh, fear not, little flock, he says to the disciples in the upper room. Later, when Paul, when he meets Paul, catches up with Saul, who becomes Paul, he says, fear not. You've been chosen. Fear not. I have a plan for you. Fear not. And now... He shows up on Patmos. John hits the ground. And the very next thing he hears Jesus say is, fear not. Now you see why a few minutes ago when we were first beginning, I said, I think this is the perfect book for this time in which we're living. Because if the number one emotion sweeping around people, sweeping through people around the world is fear, then what better place for us to be looking than the words of Jesus and to him himself who says, don't be afraid. I've got this. Fear not. I mentioned this earlier as we were getting ready to start the mean tonight, but in 1 John 4 it says, God is love. And then just a few verses later, it says in verse 18, perfect love casts out or expels or eliminates all what? Fear. So think about it. If God is love, then Jesus is God, and that means Jesus is love as well. So love, per, love appears to John. And the first thing love says when it shows up is, fear not. Perfect love, that would be Jesus, casts out all fear. Fear not. Can you hear him saying your name there? Put your own name in it. Fear not, Lee. Fear not, Margie. Fear not, Rosemary. Fear not, Bruce. Fear not, fear not, Daniel. Fear not. Put, put your name in there. Whatever it is, it might be troubling you. You can hear him say to you, no need to be afraid. Maybe you fear that you're a failure or that there's some pending calamity or there's some illness or there's some di diagnosis that's been given to you or a member of your family or, or maybe there's some financial challenge that's threatening on your horizon or maybe there's some need for work that you're having a hard time uh, coming up with. And I can hear him saying to you and to me, whatever the situation, whatever the circumstances, fear not. Don't be afraid. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on who? You. That would be referring to God. That would be referring to Jesus. And that says here's why he'll be in peace. First of all, he keeps, he, keeps, he keeps focused on you. And secondly, he trusts you. See those two things? So the solution to fear in the troubled times that we're living in, keep our eyes on Jesus and trust that he's got this. And remind ourselves in his word that he says, no fear. Don't be afraid. I've got this. No fear. Well, Jesus just doesn't just simply tell John not to be afraid. He gives them some excellent reasons why he doesn't need to be afraid. Revelation 1, uh, verses 17 to 18. He laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. And now he's given him some reasons why he doesn't need to be afraid. Notice the reasons. 
He says, don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm the first and I'm the last. There's another way of saying I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. I'm A to Z and everything in between. I've got this. Then he continues. He continues. He says, I am he who lives and was dead. Well, that's pretty amazing. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Behold, he says, I'm alive forevermore. Forevermore. And then Jesus doesn't just stop right there. He goes on to say amen to to the thing he just said. Uh, sometimes a preacher will try to get a congregation to say amen. He'll say something like, you know, what do you say? And the people go, amen. That's our cue. Amen. Jesus didn't wait for anybody to give him a cue. He said, I was dead, but I'm alive. And I'm not just alive. I'm alive forever. And then he goes, amen. He says it himself. Doesn't wait for anybody else to say it. Amen. Uh, basically, he's saying, uh, I, I am... I, I'm, I'm alive forevermore. They can't impeach me, and I'm not going to resign. Furthermore, he says, I have the keys. Did I have that there? He says, I have the keys of the grave and of death. I have the keys to the grave and to death. Think about that. The keys to the grave and to death. What's he saying? He's saying death is no big deal to me. I can unlock death and set the captives free. I believe he still holds the keys. He hasn't. You know, Steve Green has a song. He holds the keys. Beautiful lyrics in that song. He holds the keys. Think about it. I mean, everybody in this room, if Jesus doesn't come first, every one of us is going to die. Everyone. The mortality rate on planet Earth is 100%. Nobody gets off. There's no exception. So we're all going to die. If Jesus doesn't come first, we're all going to die. And that would be a terrifying thought, except that we know the guy who has the keys to the grave. So that's why it says in Thessalonians, we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. Margie told a story about Harold, very beginning, a guy named Harold, grew up to be a preacher. And Harold told a story about once when he was a preacher that uh, he was asked to do the funeral sermon for a little six-year-old girl that had died tragically and unexpectedly. The little girl's mother was a Christian. The little girl's father was an atheist. But they were both at the funeral. And when Pastor Richards, Harold, finished the service that he was there for, they had an open casket for people to walk past for one farewell, final farewell as they leave. And then, as often is the case, the people who had come to attend the service vacated the room, and the parents, the family members, had the opportunity to have one last goodbye. And Pastor Richards was standing there beside the little girl's casket. And so here comes the mother and the father. And they stand there, both of them are weeping, and they stand there looking at the little sleeping form or the little unconscious form or whatever you want to call it. You call, I guess, death. And the mother, Pastor Richard said, the mother bent over and she kissed the little girl's forehead. I have to tell you, I, I got my sequences back backwards because before the mother kissed the girl's forehead, the father stood there. And you could see, Pastor Richard said, you could see the father's jaw muscles clenching and unclenching. He was just tense and angry and his juggler veins were bulging and his teeth were clenched and his fists were tight and he looked down at her and he snarled out these words goodbye forever and he turned and walked away angry and then Pastor Richard said the mother stooped over and kissed the little girl's forehead 
And she said, Good night. I'll see you in the morning. See the contrast there? For someone who doesn't know the one who holds the keys to the grave, it's goodbye forever. But to someone who knows the one who holds the keys, it's see you later. Good night. See you in the morning. When all the shadows flee. Yeah, sleep well. See you in the morning. He holds the keys. He holds the keys. I think John must have instantly remembered when Jesus said, I hold the keys to the grave here on the island of Patmos, which you just read. I think John must have instantly remembered Jesus standing at the tomb of Lazarus because John was there. And Jesus said, roll away the stone. And John saw Jesus say, Lazarus, come on out. He'd been dead uh, for three, at least three, if not more days. My cousin Gary says he was stinking dead. He had been decaying. St we know he was stinking dead because Martha said, don't roll away the tomb. It's going to smell horrible. The stench will be horrible. Don't, don't roll away the stone. But John was there, and John saw Lazarus come forth as Jesus unlocked the key, so to speak, unlocked the lock with the key at the grave. He must have remembered that. He must have remembered in John 11, Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. He must have, believed, he must have remembered that. Margie, did I have the screen of that? Yeah. Look at that. I like that picture. Everybody's looking at Lazarus like, are you kidding me? This guy's, he's back? <laughs> he's back? Whoa. Yeah, I guess so. I'm the resurrection and the life. By the way, have you ever thought about why do you say Lazarus come forth? Have you ever thought about that? Do you know, in those days, it took a lot of effort to excavate a tomb out of sandstone. So you just you they they, they multitask with those tombs. They, they didn't just bury one person. The whole family gets buried in there. You know, they don't. It, it's kind of a hard deal to put together. So the whole family. So this this is a whole family line. I mean, probably his parents, his aunts and uncles, and everybody else is in there. See, and so when Jesus says Lazarus come forth, he he singles him out because if Jesus hadn't singled Lazarus out, the whole family would have come out. You know, so he has because it, it's nothing for him. He holds the keys. He holds the keys. And John must have also remembered that funeral procession that left Nain. Remember the, the widow of Nain? Her husband has died. She has one son. Now he's died. There's nobody left for her. And they're leaving Nain. And uh, Jesus touches the funeral uh, procession, stops the funeral procession. And he says to the mother, don't be afraid. John remembers that. And then he grabs the hand of the deceased and lifts him off that litter that they're carrying him on. John must have remembered that. Oh, and then, of course, John was with Peter and James and the mother and father of the little girl. Remember I told you about the little girl, Jairus? She's died. And they get there. And the hired mourners are making all kinds of racket. And Jesus says, hey, she's not really dead. You know, just knock it off. And they go, listen, you must be a country bumpkin that doesn't know anything because we know death when we see it and the girl's dead, you know? And Jesus says, well, get out of the way because I'm going to take care of this. And he goes in and he tells Peter, James, and John, you can come in with me if you want. And they do. And then John watched as Jesus took the hand of that little girl. You guys know what REM sleep is? Rapid eye movement sleep? Um, that's that, that's a, a particular kind of sleep. that You do it every night whether you know it or not. And during the time when you're having the REM sleep, it's called rapid eye movement because your eyeballs are moving during the time you're having that kind of sleep. Everybody has that kind of phase. It happens more than once throughout the night. And so Jesus says to the little girl, Talitha kumi, which is another way of saying little girl, wake up, rise. And John is peering over Jesus' shoulder, looking down at the form of this girl still in death. And all of a sudden, under the eyelids that are closed, bloop, 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 bloop. The eyes move. And then the lids open. 
And there she is. And Jesus scoops her up in his arms, hands her to her parents, says she's probably hungry. And then Jesus says something hilarious. I think it's hilarious. He says to the parents of the girl he just resurrected, why don't we just keep this between us? Don't bother to tell anybody about this one. Like, are you going to keep quiet about having resurrection, having a deceased member of your family? Don't, he says, don't tell anybody about this. Why you can't keep quiet about that. John has to remember all these things. So when Jesus says, I'm holding the keys to the grave and to death, John goes back and he goes, well, that's the guy. That's him. And I believe that if, um, if John was uh, here talking to us today, he would say something like this. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And John says to us in our churches here today, uh, Revelation 1, verses 4 to 7, he says, so grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. He's saying, grace and peace. That's what, that's what you have. Grace and peace. He's coming. And grace and peace from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. He says, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And then John does like Jesus. He says, amen himself. That's what he just said. He says, to him be glory forever. Amen, John says. And then notice what he says last. This is how he ties it off. He says, and behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye is going to see him. In other words, you know what John's saying? He hasn't forgotten about us. It might look like he's forgotten when the world gets so bad that they have to lock down half of Home Depot. It might look like he's forgotten us. When the world gets so bad, they have to shut down Walmart. It might look like he's forgotten. But John's going, no, no. He hasn't forgotten about us. He remembered an old man on the island of Patmos one Sabbath. And he hasn't forgotten about you or me today. And so, what's the initial message of the book of Revelation? Chapter 1, what's the initial message? Three things. The initial message is... No fear. That's the first part. The second one is, I haven't forgotten you. You know, you might think it's been forgotten, but I haven't forgotten. And the third one is, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. This is a wonderful way to start a book, right? Can you imagine a better way to start a book? I mean, we're coming out of the starting gate. No fear. I haven't forgotten you, and I'm coming back for you. It doesn't get any better than that. Isaiah 49, 16, like God's going, Jesus is saying, hey, look, 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 I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. Huh? See the nail scars? Do you think I'm going to forget you? Do you think I'm going to forget you? <sighs> no chance. He hasn't forgotten the promise he made to John. And, he, and I'm so glad that John recorded it. You probably all have this psalm, this verse memorized, but just look at it there on the screen. Maybe, maybe read it with me out loud, huh? Just read this with me out loud. Let not your heart be what? Troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John had heard this from Jesus 60 years earlier when John, when John saw Jesus rising. 65 years earlier, he'd, see, he'd heard Jesus say these words. He'd heard it from the two angels that were standing by, remember? There were two angels standing by the group of disciples as they watched Jesus leave. And the angels said, he's coming back, guys. The same Jesus that you see going up into heaven, he's coming back. He'd heard it from them as well. I mean, Max 111, there it is. Uh, put it on the screen, the next slide, if you would, please. The angel said, men of Galilee, 
why are you standing here looking into the sky? That same Jesus that you just saw leaving, he's been taken from you into heaven, but guess what? He's coming back. Next slide, please. He's coming back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And so now, as John sees on the island of Patmos, chapter 1, book of Revelation, as John sees the glorified Jesus, this is Jesus blazing. This is not Jesus meek and lowly, you know, little baby in Bethlehem. This is Jesus, Lord God Almighty, Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, radiating glory that's turning the island on fire. And he sees him. And, G and, and, and John says, it's going to happen. I've seen him myself with my own two eyes, just as he said it would. It's going to happen just as he said it would. He's going to come through with the goods. Jesus does not write checks that he can't cash. He's coming through with the goods. He will not forget us. And it puts me in mind of a little poem I want to read you as we conclude. This poem is uh, about a, a, an actual incident. Um, some of you are old enough to remember that there was once a, a celebrity kind of a person by the name of Jack Benny. And Jack Benny was married and uh, had a, a long, um, uh, they celebrated many anniversaries together. And then his wife died, whom he loved dearly. And uh, this poem has to do with what happened <clears throat> after he died. So, <clears throat> red roses were her favorite. Her name was also Rose. And every year her husband sent them tied with pretty bows. The year he died, the roses were delivered to her door. The card said, be my valentine, like all the years before. Each year he'd send her roses, and the note would always say, I hope I love you even more this year than last year on this day. My love for you will always grow with every passing year. She knew this was the last time the roses would appear. She thought he ordered roses in advance before this day. My loving husband did not know that he would pass away. But a year went by, and it was hard to live while he was gone. The loneliness and solitude just lingered on and on. And then the very hour, as on Valentine's before, the doorbell rang, and there were roses sitting by her door. She looked at them in disbelief, She'd figured they would stop. She went inside and dialed the phone to call the florist shop. The owner answered and she asked if he could please explain why anyone a joke would play that caused her so much pain. I know your husband passed away more than a year ago, the owner said. I knew you'd call and that you'd want to know. The flowers you received today were paid for in advance. Your husband always planned ahead. He left no thing to chance. There is a standing order which I have on file down here. He paid so much, I promise you will get them every year. There's also another thing I think that you should know. He wrote a special little card and left it years ago. He said, if I should ever learn that he's no longer there, that's the card that should be sent to you the following year. She thanked him and hung up the phone, her tears now flowing hard. And then with fingers trembling, she opened up the card. Inside the card, she saw that it had he had written her a note. She read the message weeping, and this is what he wrote. Hello, my love. I know it's been a year since I've been gone. I hope it hasn't been too hard for you to carry on. I want you to be comforted in spite of all those tears, so that is why the roses will be sent to you for years. The roses will come every year, and they will only stop when your door is not answered as the florist knocks and knocks. He will come five times more that week in case you have gone out. But after his last visit, he will know without a doubt to take the flowers to the place where I've instructed him and leave those roses where we are together once again. It's a beautiful little poem. But Jesus hasn't forgotten us. And he's going to do more than just give us some roses. He says, I want you to be with me where we are. In the poem, he said, I instruct that the, the flowers be delivered to where we are together once again in death. But Jesus says, I want you to be where I am. And it's not going to be in death. It's going to be in the new earth. And we will be together with him. And I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor things past or things to come, nor principalities or darkness, nothing can separate us 
from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's what chapter one of Revelation starts us off with. And I want you to just hear closing song, Buddy Hotelling singing about I am persuaded. short announcement before you leave. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for not forgetting John on the island and for reminding us in this book that you haven't forgotten us either. Thanks for the promise that you're coming back for your friends. And thank you that even though it looks like things are just going down the drain in so many ways, we don't have to be concerned about it. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be fearful. You've got it, you've got us, and you're going to take us all the way home. And so we just want to cling to you, and um, thank you for the hope we have in your name. Amen. So here's the announcement real quickly. This is a series. There's 13 parts to this. There's 12. There's 12 parts to this series, all right? 12 different presentations. Three more are going to be tomorrow. The first one comes at 9.30. The entire 9.30 slot will be for next in the that series. And then the 11 o'clock worship hour slot tomorrow is going to be the third one in the series. Then there's a fellowship lunch or potluck. After that, at 2 o'clock, one more in the series tomorrow. So we have three tomorrow. Then Sunday evening, and Pastor, I don't know, are, are, you, are you having a, a light supper on just the weeknights or is it Sunday night as well? I don't know. 
Sunday night as well. Okay, so then Sunday through Friday evening next week, there will be a light supper at 5.30, and then the meetings will continue each evening at 6.30. Um, and then the following Saturday, same schedule um, for the first two meetings, the 9.30 and the 11 o'clock, and then that will be the end. Uh, the 11 o'clock one will be the final in the series. Anyway, um, good news, it just keeps getting better and better, and it reaches a wonderful climax at the very end, which is why at the very end of the book of Revelation, John says, even so, come Lord Jesus. So uh, we hope to see you at the rest of them. God bless you, each one. Have a safe journey home tonight, and look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 930.